session from UNCG Libraries on what's up with predatory journals, red flags, and gray areas. Um, please note that the transcript does show up on the right, uh, and you can turn that off and it won't hurt anything, but we will also close caption this in YouTube. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Sam, and thanks everybody for being here. I have a lot of stuff to go through today, and so we're going to kind of try to go kind of quickly, but definitely if you have questions along the way, please ask. And I have put a link in the chat, uh, go.uncg.edu slash RA0123. That will take you to the slides if you'd like to follow along or consult them later. This is me. I'm Anna Kraft. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm coordinator of scholarly communications in the UNCG University Libraries. And I might actually turn off my camera because I'm getting a notification about bad network quality, and maybe this will help. Um, so we'll give that a try. Okay. So recognizing predatory journals, this can be really challenging. And just to start us off, I want to say that if you need assistance with questions about journal quality outside of this session, you can always contact your liaison librarian. Uh, and if you're not sure who that is, we have a link that we can share. And you can reach out to me. We are glad to help with this stuff. We know that it can be hard. And I would love it if y'all would be willing to share in uh, a Mentimeter activity what you associate with predatory academic publishing. So there are no wrong answers here. Uh, anything that you, any words or phrases or thoughts that you have about this, if you would either hold up your phone and scan that QR code, it will take you to this link, or you can go to www.menti.com and enter the code 39235393. And I'm going to give y'all a minute to do that. So there are two questions. The first one is, what does predatory mean to you in the context of academic publishing? And then the second one is, uh, we'll ask you if you have ever received a solicitation perhaps via email from a journal that you think might be predatory. And you can answer yes, no, or I'm not sure. And I will give you all a minute to think on that. And then we will take a look at the results. And I'll also say that we may have a few folks join us a little bit late, which is fine. Um, because of course we will have a recording at the end that Sam will share with people. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. All right, so we're getting a few responses. What does predatory mean to you in the context of academic publishing? No quality control, bad behaving journals, journals that want your money in exchange to publish, illegitimate and low quality publications, detrimental to scientific process and advancement. Good, great. So all of these things can be true in, the, in relation to predatory journals. And we've got some answers here. Have you received an email solicitation from a predatory journal? couple of yeses, one I think so, but I'm not sure. So people do have some experience with this. Thanks, y'all. All right, so moving forward, I do want to note that some people really don't like this word predatory in relation to publications, and especially journals and publishers really tend to strongly dislike being labeled as predatory, especially publicly. Is there a better term? There are lots of other words and phrases that have been talked about as potential replacements for the word predatory in this context. And some people do prefer other words, but for the purposes of this talk today, predatory is a word that we're going to use because it seems to be the most recognized and used in academia. 
So here's what we're going to do. We're going to define predatory publishing. We'll recognize some practices in this realm. We'll see some examples of email solicitations and websites. I'll share some resources and strategies to help you evaluate journal quality. And of course, there will be time for questions. And you can ask questions at any point by entering them in the chat. And we'll also try to save some time at the end. So what are predatory journals? This is a definition from a comment piece in Nature a few years ago. And I like this definition. It's got a couple of things going on here. So they say predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. What does this mean? So if we break this out a little bit, there are a couple of different pieces. This prioritization of self-interest, when we talk about this here, we're really talking about financial gain. So they are looking to make money, but not all for-profit publishers are predatory and not all publishers that charge article processing charges or APCs are predatory. So just that on its own is not a sign that a journal is necessarily predatory. This piece of at the expense of scholarship, so they are not prioritizing scholarly quali quality, they're not providing perhaps quality control. Um, but along with this, failing to follow best practices in scholarly publishing, while it's not good, it isn't always a sign of bad intentions. Journals uh, can start out in lots of different places, and some of them learn along the way and improve their practices. They're not all setting out to be bad players in this system. But this last piece this characterized by false or misleading information. If they are, dis are deliberately misleading authors and readers, this is a really bad sign. So if this piece is there, then it is almost definitely a predatory journal. What are these publishers trying to do? Essentially, what they want is to make money off your scholarship without adding any value or doing any work really on their end. So they're charging these publication fees without providing quality control, such as peer review, and without providing the other publishing services that we would expect from a legitimate publisher, perhaps copy editing, layout, proofreading, anything to improve the scholarship. But they are misleading authors by saying that they do provide these things, that they do provide peer review and these other services. What's the impact here? There are a couple of things that can happen. It can be a waste of money, which can include tax dollars and grant funds that uh, might be used to pay article processing charges. Authors may have their scholarship called into question if they publish in these uh, journals and that can impact their careers. But more seriously, this unreviewed scholarship is being presented then as having been through peer review, having been vetted, which misleads readers, and that can have serious consequences, including that other researchers might try to build their work on flawed scholarship. And I also want to note that predatory can mean different things to different people. So there are a number of major publishers out there that have huge profit margins and make so much money from um, academic scholarship, but they're not really predatory in the sense of misleading authors. Uh, but some people do use this term to talk about those publishers with those high APC costs and high profit mar margins um, unrelated to the quality of the journal. So that's not what we're focusing on today. And I also want to, to uh, make a note about open access. So open access is not what we're talking about today. This is scholarship that's free to read. There are no access barriers such as paywalls. There are sometimes charges associated with these journals where they're not being funded through um, those subscriptions. So instead they're funded through APCs. Uh, predatory journals can and often do refer to themselves as open access, but 
not all open access journals are predatory. And open access in general is great. If you want to learn more about it and the benefits, I've got a link here to slides and a recording. Um, and if you all have questions about that at any point, we can definitely talk about it, but that's not the focus of, of what we're talking about today. We're talking about predatory journals um, that are not true legitimate open access journals. And another note, unfortunately, there aren't just predatory journals. That's our focus today, but you may also see predatory conferences, predatory book publishers, and other non-scholarly publishing services like vanity presses and research marketing firms who would be delighted to take your money um, for various reasons relating to your scholarship. So let's dive in here. How can I recognize a predatory journal? Sadly, it's not always easy. There's no one thing that you can easily apply across all journals that's definitely going to say, yes, this is predatory. There are a lot of diff different potential red flags. There's some gray areas. In every situation, every journal is a little bit different. So these are some questions that I would start with. And we're gonna walk through each of these and look at some examples of each of these on the following slides. We'll start with, does this solicitation relate to my area of expertise? This is a, a major sign of a lot of predatory journals. They're contacting potential authors indiscriminately, generally through email, without any regard for the journal's supposed scope or the author's area of work. So I'm a librarian. I don't have an engineering background, so I can delete this solicitation from the American Journal of Engineering Research immediately. And just because I wrote an article once that has landscape in the title doesn't make me an expert in geology or geography or anything else. This actually is not at all related to what this, uh, this is actually a conference solicitation. They are inviting me to be a speaker about uh, at the World Congress on Geology and Earth Science, and my work has nothing to do with this. And you can actually see in that upper left, geology at meetingsllc.com. That doesn't sound very scholarly. Here's another example. I get a lot of solicitations as a librarian for dentistry and oral health journals. And I'm pretty sure this is because I once wrote an article about oral histories that related to libraries. It wasn't anything to do with this area of research. So this is really not somewhere that I should be publishing. Related to this, one of the ways that predatory journals are often reaching out to people is that they're going to the tables of contents from newly published, legitimate, reputable journals, and they're pulling author information from there. So they're pulling based on names and keywords. That's how I got many of those solicitations on those previous slides. So they're pulling that citation information and watch out for solicitations that address you in a name format you associate with citations. These are often being created by um, probably a program that is just pulling that data and formatting an email automatically. They're not being constructed by a person. And as we've seen, these journals also sometimes use keywords to try to match your published article to their scope. And it can be pretty funny with that, you know, oral history versus dentistry. They're very different. So here in this example, my name and an article title that I had recently published were pulled from a recent publication or table of contents. So they say, Dear Craft AR, it's honored to have read your published article, blah, 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 blah. We also start to see some of this kind of strange language that is not uh, what we would expect in a professional communication. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Here's another example. Dear Professor Craft in R. Again, the format is a little bit strange. And here again, I'm being solicited related to dentistry, which I really have no business presenting or speaking on. This is actually a solicitation to be a peer reviewer for an article called Re-Entry of Spacecraft to Earth Atmosphere. And I don't actually usually 
associate predatory journals with trying to do any level of peer review, but I guess sometimes it does happen. But I think my only qualification for potentially reviewing this article is that my last name is Kraft, and the word Kraft is used in this title. So this is wild. I definitely should not be doing this. Our next area is the scope. You want to think about if the scope of the publication makes sense. Most reputable journals publish within a niche under a broader discipline, and they would have an editorial board and peer reviewers that have expertise in that area. They would know who to reach out to for uh, different things that would fall within that area. So you want to look at the journal's aims and scope and think about if they align with your work and also if they make sense. If you're looking at a website, you might look for the journal information, aims and scope, about the journal, wording like that. Here's an example of one that's got a lot of problems, but in the context of scope, International Journal of Arts and Social Science is very broad. And even more alarmingly, when we look down at what they say under Dear Professor, slash researcher, International Journal of Arts and Social Science is an international journal which aims at meeting all the needs of diverse sections of people in the areas of humanities, and this is a little cut off, humanities and social studies is what they said. So, I mean, sure, except are they really going to have people who can review in all of these areas? and have that kind of expertise? I think not. Our next area is the timeline. And this is an area where some predatory journals have unfortunately been getting wise to the fact that people can sniff out some of these real unrealistic timelines. But you wanna think about if a proposed timeline allows time for not only authors to submit, but for the steps that would need to happen along the way with publishing and review. So being reviewed by the editor and peers, maybe revisions and resubmission, copy editing, proofreading by the author, layout or typesetting, and then publication in an online system. Journal publication uh, really varies journal by journal. It can be an article by article. It can be a, a kind of drawn out process. And when, with some journals, it can be quicker, but it's never overnight. So this, to be clear, is not a predatory example. These, This is a time to acceptance example uh, chart from the Springer Nature portfolio showing some of their journals. And that first column of numbers is submission to first editorial decision. So this is when the author submits and then the editor looks at the submission and says either, yes, this is something that's within scope, we could send this for peer review, or no, this is out of scope, it's not appropriate, and sends it back to the author. It has not been through peer review at that point. These are pretty quick, within about a week for most of the journals. The next column is submission to first post-review decision. So here you've gotten feedback from peer reviewers and they're saying maybe revise and resubmit or no, this we think this should be rejected or whatever it is. And here it's taking generally more than a month, um, maybe as much as two months. Submission to accept in that far right column, you haven't even been published at this point. This is just your article has been through peer review, revisions, it's been accepted. And here we're looking at several months, maybe even getting close to a year in some cases. Again, every journal is going to be different, but there's going to be time, there's need, going to need to be time for these different things that happen. Here is a wild publication timeline. And this is actually from that previous example, International Journal of Arts and Social Science. Further down in that email, we had this uh, paper submission deadline, July 20th, acceptance rejection, five to six days, paper online publication, July 30th. There's no time within this time frame to allow for any kind of quality control or really anything to happen. What's going on with journals that operate like this is they're basically receiving papers, accepting all of them, 
and maybe putting some branding on them and putting them online. They're not providing any kind of legitimizing or quality control or anything to the process. Who is soliciting my work? So here we're talking about people and publishers. The person who reaches out to you, do they appear to be an academic? Are they affiliated with a university or a research institution? Are they a legitimate researcher in your discipline or your field? If the answer is no, that doesn't necessarily mean it's predatory, but these are some things to investigate. Also, is the solicitor contacting you from an institutional or an organizational email account? Or is it maybe some random Gmail account? Does this appear to be a professional communication? And then also, is it a publisher that you recognize? Again, we aren't going to know all publishers that are out there. There are some big ones that are very familiar to a lot of people, and there are small ones. And just because you haven't heard of one doesn't mean that it's bad, but these are things to think about and potentially investigate. So here is an example that one of our researchers got and forwarded to me. And what we've got here at the bottom in uh, the closing with regards, Naina K, Editorial Assistant, Archives of Metabolic Syndrome, Delaware, US. And all of this could be true. Um, there's not a lot of information though to go on if we wanted to learn more. We could go to the journal site, see if this person has is actually listed. What kind of stands out to me though is this Delaware US piece. That's not typically how we in this country write our address um, and location info, although if it, something's being sent out more widely uh, internationally, maybe that would be more appropriate. Um, but also this, an editorial assistant reaching out like this, it could be legitimate, but I would also wonder if they are just emailing anyone, anywhere versus someone who is actually an editor or knows more about the process. Um, so this doesn't isn't necessarily bad, at least just based on that, but there are some things to think about. Here's another one that's a little more problematic. Um, we have less information, just one name, Christine Dale, Journal of Oral Infection and Pathology. Again, this is showing that uh, I am, again, a librarian being solicited by a journal that has nothing to do with my field. So this is a bad uh, red flag just immediately. But that aside, another thing that jumped out at me here was this uh, website that they've got. Authors can submit their manuscripts at scholarjournal.biz. A .biz uh, web address does not fill me with confidence when it comes to scholarly publishing. So that would be a red flag for me. Also, who is this publisher? We're going to come back to this example a little bit later, um, but this, in this case, we've got Things and Best, Sabrina Jones, Editorial Office, Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology, sounds real, David Publishing Company. Don't know them. Um, doesn't mean it's bad, but spoiler, it is bad. We will come back to this. And again, we see a Delaware address, which I think is interesting. So an unfamiliar publisher might need uh, might need a little more looking into. My favorite area, um, is this a professional communication? Does this language make sense? Does this language reflect what you would expect in correspondence from a professional journal? Uh, a lot going on in this email, subject, generous support, dear Dr. Blank. Dear Dr. Blank, hope you are doing well. We are in need of articles for the successful release of volume six, issue three. This is a little bit cut off, but they are requesting uh, support from eminent people like you. My favorite part though is, we hope you don't disappoint us. Acknowledge this email within 24 hours. This is not how a legitimate publisher would reach out to a scholar. So we definitely don't want anything to do with this journal. Another example, many of these solicitations from predatory journals can be very flattering, 
So they will say something very positive about your work. They will reference one of your articles. Uh, this one says, Dear Craft AR. Again, we see that kind of pulled from a citation format of my name. This was constructed via a program, um, not by a person. Greetings. We have learnt about your precious paper. And maybe I do think it's precious, but this is not how a professional journal would be reaching out to me. My favorite part of this one is that this is actually a predatory journal that is soliciting me to publish with them based on um, my article about identifying predatory journals. And here they have pulled uh, my article title, is this a quality journal to publish in? How can you tell? They say it's been published in Serials Review, which is true. Um, it has drawn attention and interest from researchers and scholars specializing in academic journals, academic libraries, open access, predatory publishing, scholarly communication. Those are the exact keywords that were in um, the metadata, the abstract that it was submitted to this journal and published. So this is not anything that they have come up with. This is, again, kind of a formula to construct this message based on my previous publication. And lots of people, maybe everyone who was published in that same issue is getting the same message formatted for them. Here's another great one, another uh, dentistry and oral health journal. Lots of interesting language here. Successfully, we have released enormous issues towards our online journal of dentistry and oral health. And toward the end, a single candle, your article would be a big asset. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but anytime you see language like this, you can just delete it. it uh, it may be uh, created by some kind of form. It may actually be someone who doesn't speak English who is trying to uh, cobble together a predatory solicitation. We see a lot of different things um, like this that are major red flags of predatory publishing. Another area that is sticky and kind of tricky is the cost. So we talked about article processing charges. We mentioned those before. Just because there is an APC doesn't mean it's predatory, but we do want to make sure that we are getting clear information about how much it's going to cost if we do publish with this journal, what kind of currency would be used, and how payments would be made. Um, if anything seems fishy related to the costs, I would recommend avoiding the journal. So here's an example. There's, again, a, a lot going on with this one. Uh, online publication charges, you can't read it very well on the screen, but are 1,000 Rs only. And I don't know what R is. I do believe it's a legitimate currency. It might be rupees. Um, but I would be careful, especially about foreign currency, with uh, thinking about questions around if this is predatory or not depending on where your journal is based, especially if, it's, if the currency matches up with where they say they are located or not. We see some other red flags here as well. Uh, fast track publication within 48 hours, that's a very bad sign. Um, and then e-certificates for all published articles within four hours. This is not something that one would expect from a, a real professional journal. We don't get e-certificates for our publishing. I also really love the font that they have chosen for the ISSN. Here's another example. Hey, Anna, Anna yes. um, yeah. someone in the chat asked, someone must be making a lot of money off of predatory journals. Has anyone, journalists, law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera ever investigated this type of fraud phishing? What a great question. So I, there is a lot of, um, writing about the problem of predatory journals in academia. And I would guess that there probably are some studies about um, related to money and profits, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and I don't know how much this has gotten into the mainstream media. I, I see it covered in um, professional contexts a lot, but I can't think of a time that I have actually seen it in a more public facing um, conversation about problems around scholarly publishing. So I might have to do a little research 
about that, especially with uh, the question of money, because it it is um, it's alarming, <laughs> and someone is potentially making a lot of money off other scholars, which is pretty sad. Um, because in some cases, these scholars like nobody comes into uh, the world knowing about predatory journals, especially if you're new to scholarship and academia, if you're a grad student or a new researcher, this isn't something that you necessarily would know unless someone tells you. Um, so yeah, it's it's very tough and problematic and like many areas of academia, kind of broken. Um, thank you for the, the question. Uh, okay, so another issue with costs, this is from another email, and at the very bottom it says we are providing 30% waiver on APC to those who submit manuscripts by the end of this month. This is not a common practice or setup with academic publishing where the price would change based on when you submit. Um, generally, the price is the price, and if you can get a discount, it would be related to maybe you're a reviewer for them, maybe you're a grad student, maybe your institution has some kind of deal with them, not that you would get a waiver based on submitting early. Also, you'll note that they don't share what the cost is in this message, so um, they, what they want is for you to go to their website and learn more and maybe send them your information. Also a great example oops, of um, alarming uh, language in that top line. You can view the detailed information about the R submission by visiting this. Um, so something's going on here that's not good. Another thing we need to think about is, is this journal really what it claims to be? So pay careful attention to the publication title. Unfortunately, some predatory journals use titles that mimic existing legitimate journals. So it might be one letter different or maybe international versus national journal of XYZ. Some predatory journals even publish under the exact same title as a legitimate journal. And you may see them use on their websites similar branding, similar colors, simil similar layout, because what they're trying to do is trick researchers into thinking it is the legitimate journal. And another thing, there's so many things to think about here. Um, journals can be sometimes transferred to new leadership or new publishers, and that can affect practices and quality in the future. So uh, this can also happen where a journal might uh, cease publishing and maybe their domain expires, nobody renews it, and a predatory publisher comes in, grabs it, and starts masquerading as that journal. So this, here we're coming back to this question of David Publishing Company. This slide has two, uh, two different Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology examples. On the left, we have from Oxford Academic, the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology associated with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society of the UK. It's been around since 1870. It's an established reputable journal, um, a major journal in that field. On the right, we have an email solicitation that one of our graduate students received that also claims to be from the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology. This is not illegal to have the same title. Um, books can be published under the same titles. It's not something that you can copyright an individual title. So this can happen with journals. So here on the right, we have somebody reaching out to graduate students and other researchers saying, we would love to so solicit your research. And they say they're the Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology. And what they are hoping is that people will think that they are the real Oxford Academic Journal of Pharmacy and Pharmacology, when in fact they are from David Publishing Company and are completely unrelated and unfortunately predatory. So I'm really glad that this graduate student reached out to ask, um, was this a real thing? Because it was not. Some solicitations, as we have seen, have many red flags. Here's one, Craft AR. We've got that kind of citation-based name format. 
We also have some strange language, deeply impressed by your previous article published in the other journal. And we see some uh, some weirdness with the font too that makes me think they're using a keyboard that is not typically used here. So we see that lowercase b looks really strange. Um, and a lower left, bring more audience through this international journal. All of the readers worldwide could keep abreast of topical frontiers in related areas. So this, though it does appear to be in my subject area, American Journal of Information Science and Technology, this is a predatory journal and I uh, get requests from them kind of regularly, sadly. Here's another one. This one is outside my area. Um, esteemed researcher, hope everything is fine with you. Things really fall apart in this next line. Um, admit, unpublied. Um, lots of language, interesting things happening there and in some of these other lines as well. So. Again, blatant red flags. Here's one of my favorites um, in the lower right. Decision on manuscript, 24 hours. Publication time, two days. We can just delete this. Also, I like their title, Research Inventee Journal. Um, we definitely don't need to be publishing here. Sometimes your spam filter will catch these things. So that can be helpful. Here again, we've we looked at this one earlier. It's got the kind of wild font for their impact factor and their ISSN and their e-certificates and their fast track publication within 48 hours. But sadly, not all predatory journal websites or emails show these glaring red flags. So some of them actually are getting better at being trickier, which is unfortunate. So you want to evaluate journals carefully before you even consider submitting your work. A quick sidebar, why am I getting so, so many solicitations for special issues? Here are a few examples, being solicited on ethnic and cultural studies special issue, another special issue about long COVID, another special issue where they want me to become a lead guest editor from this predatory information science and technology journal. So are all special issues bad? No, of course not. Um, but they're not all created equal. There are some publishers that are putting out hundreds or even thousands of special issues in a single year, which creates a lot of questions about editorial oversight and quality control. So if your work is solicited for a special issue, give careful consideration to the credentials of the person or people who are editing the issue in addition to considering the quality of the journal overall. So we only have a little bit of time left, so I'm going to quickly mention some tools, additional tools and strategies that can help with this. Critical thinking and information literacy, these are really your first line of defense. We've looked at a lot of examples that were pretty blatant, but it's not always easy. And sometimes you may actually need to consult other resources to make a determination. Here's some tips. We've talked about researching the journal first. I just want to reiterate. And I would also recommend that you don't click on links that are directly in the email. Sometimes a link may look uh, harmless, but it's actually taking you to a different place or it's tracking that you are clicking on it, which might mean you'll get more email. So if you want to look up one of these journals, I would recommend instead type it into your search engine of choice and go from there. If you go to the journal website, as you would do with an email, look for those red flags, language, grammar, other things. Also consider looking at their recently published content. They may include scholarship that can stand on its own. Sometimes legitimate researchers do, they get published in predatory journals because they get taken in. Um, but you may also see nonsensical or out of scope papers. So that can be a red flag. And I would also recommend that you don't just read what the journal says about itself. Look for external information. That's called lateral reading. So you can do this by look, going to your preferred search engine and looking up the journal. And if you're still not sure, if you need a second opinion, definitely reach out to the library. You can contact your liaison or you can contact me. And going back to that lateral reading idea, I would recommend starting with your search engine and then 
often what I do is I search for the journal title or the conference or the publisher, and I add in the word predatory. And that can bring up interesting conversations in different areas of the internet. You, of course, want to think critically about that. Consider the authority of who is sharing what information and why. Another resource for publishers and journals can sometimes be Wikipedia. So that can be a potential location where you can see documentation of journal or publisher history and behavior. Sometimes there's even a scandals area of those uh, articles. There's also a website called Think, Check, Submit, and they have a checklist similar to what we have talked about already that um, can help you walk through considering journal quality. There's another more detailed tool called Journal Evaluation Tool. This is a rubric and scoring sheet that can help you evaluate journal characteristics and whether or not they would be positive indicators or negative indicators. And then keep in mind, it might not actually be a predatory journal. It might be something else, like a vanity press. These are generally pay to publish and there's no peer review or quality control. So it sounds like it could be predatory, but the difference is that they are not claiming to offer peer review or quality control. They're just saying, if you want to pay, we will publish it. I'm also increasingly seeing these commercial or marketing opportunities where non-academic companies are reaching out to researchers, offering services to promote or showcase scholarship, or maybe create some kind of media and they, of course, are expecting you to pay for these services. And in some cases, it can be a legitimate scholarly publishing opportunity. So it can be very uncommon to see direct email solicitations from real non-predatory journals, but this does happen. Um, although in my own experience, the percentage is much lower of it being a real solicitation versus predatory, get way more predatory solicitations. Here's an example quickly of a commercial solicitation. The point um, I wanna draw out is that they, what they say about themselves, at Research Features, we are committed to making all research more accessible and engaging. We distribute the content we produce strategically to people in industry, government, and the public to help bridge the gap between often complex bodies of research and these audiences. So they're not claiming to be a scholarly group. And this could be, maybe there are researchers who really do need to get their research into uh, the public realm. Um, but think about what your goal is. Here's another example. This one on the left, I'm being solicited to by a company that wants to create a podcast about my research and have me pay for it. And on the right, I'm being solicited by a company that wants to create a scientific animation of my research and of course have me pay for it. These could be useful in certain situations, potentially. Um, but if, you're, if your goal is to build your scholarly um, publishing history and your scholarly credentials, these are probably not what you want to do. The thought I wanna leave y'all with is that if you need assistance in evaluating publication venues, we can help in the library. You can contact your liaison librarian or you can contact me and we will be glad to help. So I know I'm about right at time here, but I can stay if y'all have questions. And there's also a link here or a page here with some um, additional resources. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen um, and bring up my camera in case there are any questions. And thanks, y'all, for being here. Um, and thanks, Sam, for running the session. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm looking at what Rachel said about the address in Delaware. Yeah, so that's the sort of thing that you might want to do if you're trying to find out if something is a real organization. Like, is is this a real place? Can I contact them? What happens if I try to, um, to look this up? Um, and again, it's fine if y'all don't have questions today, but do remember that if you need support in this area in the future, we are glad to help. And um, if this kind of information would be useful for courses or departments, 
um, let us know because we would be glad to put something together. We would definitely rather um, y'all reach out to us uh, than to have somebody actually get submit their work to a predatory journal because then it can be pretty hard to get it back. Um, yeah. Sam, gotten any predatory solicitations lately? Yes, I've, I'm getting like a kind of aggressive one from a public health journal um, because I'm the public health librarian um, where they're like, we're doing a COVID issue, um, but it has a lot of the signs of predatory stuff. And I mean, they're just, they're like, they, e they emailed me three times yesterday and they're like, we need an answer. We need an answer. You're like, no, like, I don't want to even like reply, but yeah, I was thinking about that during the session. I was like, they're really, they're coming hard these days. Um, and the way they're like wording it is basically like, we can't move on with our publication until you like, you know, write back, you know, you're like, I, I know that's not true, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, they've gotten aggressive. I feel like it has to be you, Sam. They can get aggressive, I guess is what I should be. Definitely can. Um, um, I didn't, Rachel, if you have a question, you're welcome to um, yeah, ask yeah. it. Um, as you're maybe getting ready, I will say, if people have to leave, um, I'm going to send out an assessment form in the email follow-up. Um, I realized as I was about to send it that I have to update it from the fall. Um, so just be on the lookout and you can let us know how this went um, anonymously. And um, our next one coming up in the series, uh, This we have a lot of good ones this uh, semester. Uh, um, the next one is APA and Inclusive Language um, on February 8th at 1 p.m. And then the next ones coming up this year are Alternatives to Scopus by our STEM librarian, Candace Jacobs. We're losing Scopus access in June 2024, if y'all haven't heard. And then bullet journaling and research by Jenny Dale um, in March. And um, just be on the lookout for those as well. Um, did you have any questions, Rachel? No, I was just gonna say thank you. This was really interesting. Um, I I have actually received some advertisements from predatory journals before, and I didn't know it was a thing. It was a situation where I was just like, this email, I mean, they don't teach you that in art school. Like, mm -hmm. I went to school for studio art, and they don't teach you that in school. Uh, and just from, like, a kind of email phishing perspective, I was like, this is, this is like a scam. Um, yeah, but thank you. It's really interesting. Um, it's like a very specific kind of fraud, and I find it fascinating. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. Um, I know Alan's in here um, from kinesiology. I've seen some um, kinesiology um, conference, predatory conferences um, pop up um, from kin grad students. And luckily, like they've, you know, gotten the stuff from us and been to some sessions where they will write me and be like, this looks kind of funny. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, and then Anna and I will look into it. Um, mostly credit to Anna. And, um, you know, we'll be like, this isn't, you know, um, right, you know. So, yeah, many keynote speech invitations. So. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yeah. definitely. And I know yeah. when I get a key, it's easy as a librarian, because, like, if I get a keynote uh, invitation from, like, a kinesiology conference, I'm like, no, I don't think they want me. <laughs> um, you know, because, like, you know, I obviously help a lot with kinesiology research, but no, I'm not, like, a kinesiologist um, or a PT <laughs> or a... Uh, athletic trainer or anything like that so it's just funny um but anyway yeah I just yeah. I mean I know you kind of talked about that Anna but I've noticed that trend going up um and I really worry about that too because that's like a lot of money involved right in terms of if you do get wrapped in in terms yeah. of travel and like everything so um yeah it's yeah. not just like losing your money like through an online portal, right? It's like you lose your time and your money and your, you know, and travel time, you know, it could be mm -hmm. truly bad. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. And the more, the more active you are professionally, like outwardly with publishing, with presenting, the more of these solicitations you're probably going to get. It seems like sometimes they also will just pull information off of um, institutional 
like web pages, but so often these are coming from the tables of contents or the program uh, programs of conferences or um, tables of contents of journals. So it's um, it's nefarious. It's really yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty upsetting because um, we've got so many too, problems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Don't> like more. <laughs> yeah, like leave us alone. Um, I think it's too nefarious in that uh, I'm my, like I was talking about that one from Public Health. Um, I wrote an article about online learning in COVID-19, like a peer-reviewed article that I got published. And that's, I think, again, these they're using COVID-19 in terms of if you have any like research on COVID-19 as like a hook, right? They're like, hey, you know, come to us if you're, you know, it's like, think about how many people are researching COVID-19, you know, still. Um, so again, it's it's a, an ethical issue, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry that I, that I talked about that. Um, so you're good. We're heading um, towards one. Um, does anyone else have any comments or questions um, before we head into our afternoon? Just remember to reach out to us, y'all. And we love uh, helping grad students and faculty and others with these questions. We wish we didn't have to. Um, we wish predatory journals weren't a thing, but we are glad to help. So definitely reach out. Yeah. And just credit to Anna as, you know, people are leaving. I should have said this at the beginning, like you've, I know you've helped a lot of people um, Mm -hmm. avoid it. And even if they have uh, gotten into something uh, without our knowledge, you've helped people navigate that as well. Mm -hmm. And and I appreciate you. Thanks, Um, Sam. (laughs) And I'm sure many teaching faculty appreciate you as well. Um, All right. So thanks, thanks, Anna. And thanks for coming. Um, This is an important topic Mm -hmm. that's not going to go away. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I wish um, I could erase them. But I wish so too. Yeah, yeah, I think about this often. Um, so anyway, thanks y'all. Um, have a great afternoon. Um, thanks again, Anna. I know yeah. this was a lot of work and you did great. And um, I'll follow up with an email soon. Sounds See great. Y'all. Have bye. a great day. Bye.